a life philosophy by Al Fry. Over our short span of years on Earth, we have come to categorize the dwellers here into two categories, the domination and those desiring to be dominated in the free and those desiring to be free. Almost without exception, the captains of industry are hardcore domination who must dominate, to some extent, hundreds or thousands of others to gain their wealth. They inwardly feel that control of another human being is perfectly justifiable and the majority of persons who work for them feel that such control of men is necessary to a civilized planet. These workers are what I call the dominated, not because they work for the domination, but because they think such control is necessary. On the other hand, we have a handful of persons who I call free, and a growing percentage of the freedom desirers. Some of the free have reasoned that since their maker or the all that is has not interfered with their freedom beyond the point of natural law, they, in turn, to advance to a level beyond the restrictions of earth, should allow and grant freedom to all. A person who is free for instance will take orders from a dominator since the dominator is responsible for the action, but the free will not order those under them to act unless the persons under them have a free choice. In conversation, this would be a would you like to instead of a do. This subtle difference of thinking is not too easy to grasp unless one gives it some thought or perhaps can recall the teachings of Christ, etc. Those younger persons of today who have rejected society's rules and standards at the expense of comfort and security so-called make up the core of what I call the free desires. Unfortunately, these persons haven't put it all into a perspective and don't really know what it is necessary to change to bring about a planet under free principles. On a domination-controlled planet, it is most difficult to accumulate quantities of the current unit value substance which is now money, without dominating. You can be a public entertainer or perhaps inherit large wealth, but generally speaking, the real are reduced to smaller business enterprises and public service jobs, or must go to work at a regular job under some undesired control. I have many friends who are domination and just as my creator grants me freedom, so do I grant these persons their freedom of choice. However, I see a vision of potential of a planet free of domination and limitations. We are part of an awesome universe and I suspect that unless we recognize and use the free laws existent, we will continue to be in the quarantine. Winter Survival Techniques by Dora Edgar, condensed from Kalichi County rendering works by way of the Green Revolution. J.G., Gill, Phillips, an Albuquerque engineer, has developed a winter camping technique using polyurethane foam equipment and Eskimo survival know-how. His equipment is warmer and lighter than any yet devised by non-Eskimos, and fantastically cheaper as well. There is a local company marketing equipment based on Phillips' principles, but it's still cheaper to make your own. We usually go about winter camping all wrong. People give up and go home because their feet get cold. Their feet get cold because boots and socks compress to the point where you're practically standing on the snow. And if the boots are waterproof, foot sweat collects and freezes. Even thick boots let in the cold after a couple of days of tramping and socks give you blisters. Gloves are just as ridiculous. Each finger is attacked from all sides by the cold. Divide and conquer. People who need fires to keep warm didn't dress warmly enough in the first place, and fire melts snow, which subsequently soaks you and freezes. Furthermore, sleeping in a bag in a tent leaves your head in the air. It is a fact that you lose more heat from your head than anywhere else. What's worse, if your bedding gets wet from a fire or a thaw, you're doomed. Wet down will freeze you almost as fast as wet cotton. It is very important to understand that different materials and techniques are needed for winter and fair weather camping. In the rain a tent is nice. In snow it's dead weight to carry. We need to move slowly in the cold so as not to waste energy or sweat too much. It is best to carry dehydrated foods and not to use fires except for a luxury. Illustrated are the patterns for a mucklick in a sleeping bag. These are made of 1 inch thick polyurethane foam, which can brought in great sheets from an upholstery supply store. The only adequate glue is 3M77. A very fine spray will seal all seams without hardening them and forming a heat leak. Just glue the cut edges together. The finished product can be covered with nylon for durability, 
The basic foam mucklick, with its double thickness of folded over foam on the bottom, is all you need in snow. But their wear can be extended and you'll be prepared for rocks and bare ground if you stuff them into army surplus canvas mucklucks, extra large for everybody, or just cover them with a canvas or nylon bag with a drawstring around the top and a string around the ankle. Reinforce the bottoms and maybe an inch or two up the sides with overshoe soles if you like. Foot sweat has a chance to evaporate in these mucklucks, and if it gets them damp, at least they stay warm. Even if you fall through ice, the water squishes out after a little walking and never does freeze. Honest. I can testify to that from personal experience. Mittens, also useful whether you camp or not, are simply folded over rectangles. The sleeping bag illustrated is an envelope just big enough to receive you wearing your clothes. You don't need any spare cold air in there. After you wiggle in, pull the drawstring, tie it, and start warming up your cocoon with your breath and body heat. Foam allows plenty of air exchange with outside. Where you sleep is an important matter. Where the wind blows free dig a ditch in the snow. Sleep in it with your sleeping bag completely wrapped in a sheet of strong polyethylene rolled into a tube that extends well beyond your feet and head. Wrap it around one and a half times to anchor under you, before you crawl in. If there's a blizzard that night you'll be covered with insulating snow, but not buried permanently, since the wind will keep a drift from forming on top of your trench. That's why you build it where the wind blows. Water from breathing and perspiration will condense on the plastic sheet rather than your foam. Shake it off in the morning. Besides mucklucks and mittens, body clothing can be made from foam as soft as you can find. One inch is best, but it may be necessary to use half inch on legs and arms, for flexibility. Rectangular sheets of approximate sizes can be wrapped around arms, legs and torso, leaving gaps for elbows and knee joints. Friction will fasten them well enough where they overlap themselves. To suit up, start with the foam next to your bare hide where it will do some good. Cotton underwear only holds moisture. Over the foam put a pair of huge loose pants and a hooded parka about five sizes too big for you. Then your mittens and mucklucks. That's all. Any more defeats your purposes of warmth, mobility, and evaporation. Rayo who called this article to my attention, doesn't think it is long enough for a very small person. E suggests making it a foot or two longer. That gives extra space for a book, some food etc. inside. E says one inch foam will pass enough light to read by. Under arctic conditions, the end can be tied off by mounting a separate drawstring part way in. Bearded hermit lives like man in 19th century. A visit with Dewey Walker is like stepping into the last century. Walker is a bearded hermit who has built his own house, makes his own shoes and grinds his own corn with a homemade mill fashioned from two pieces of limestone. He is 61 and has lived alone 15 years in a wooded area near the Mississippi River in southwestern Illinois. There is no road to the clearing where he has constructed a one-room log home. He has few complaints. One he mentioned was the shortage of flax thread, which he needs to make his shoes from discarded tire casings. Cotton thread doesn't wear well. Walker built his heavy grindstone mill for the corn he grows in the clearing. He grows most of his food. Anything else he needs, thread, tobacco, or lard, he gets by bartering with an occasional passing neighbor. I don't remember the last time I went to town, he says. He receives no pension or relief money, but once in a while he trades a few hours' work for a distant neighbor for a few things from Grand Tower, a town of 1,000 population. Walker's house is the work of a 19th century craftsman. He learned woodworking as a boy and was employed in a sawmill. He never married, and until clearing his portion of the woods worked as a hired hand around the area. Using an antique tool called a fro, he split over 600 shingles for his roof. He still makes barrel stays for water casks and furniture for his home, working with hand tools, some of which he made himself. But Walker is thoroughly happy. I like the feeling of independence. Investigating Von U in Sweden by B. Lan, wish I could help you on investigating Von U here in Sweden. Someone else must look into this. Not because I'm not interested. It's just that paranoia reigns supreme. I've been here four years. On five different occasions, I feel attempts have been made on my life. These have ranged from chloral hydrate poisoning, and walk home past the canal, 
to road accidents, two, one of which left a body, to being followed in other countries, when I was looking for a safer home, which led directly to James Bond's stuff and a pool of blood in front of my house. I think they got the guy in the front room. Another time I got a fastful of gas, what smells like onion, when I should have been sleeping. At the same time a key was tried in my door lock. These guys spoke very good American. I live in a 912 gas chamber complete with cooking gas piped in. I've been told that another man killed himself by gas in this room. Sweden has the highest suicide rate in the world. They call it suicide when the cops kill. Jimi Hendrix died in London. He was sleeping in a hotel with a white girl. Two coroner's reports. First said, obstruction in throat. The second said, drugs. He died with two great horse pills of something just poked deep into his throat and drugged so he couldn't cough. The girl was unharmed. It's my idea that he was gassed too, same as me. Possibly the girl too. I can see little teams of specialists who just tore around doing errands. I met one of them a La Orient Express on a train in East Berlin. Well, we got to talking. Nothing I said surprised him. He even added details. He said, nothing personal, your name is on a list. I heard this phrase, nothing personal, before. Always just before I got shafted. This was also just before an incident. This guy was obviously on speed, maybe other stuff too. This explains a lot. A job to do, fine, temporarily I'm Superman. I know where the body is buried so after a while, I get an OD. Of something. Then the boss doesn't worry about loose talk. Mass anything has got to be done by idiots. Mass espionage and repression is no different. Drugs help reward and punish. They also close the books. Of course only idiots will be attracted by these methods. There are other methods too but they are more expensive and take up intelligent people's time, so are used more sparingly to achieve more remunerative results. Vonu can be done anywhere. Years ago, an American army deserter married a French woman and lived with her about 15 years without anyone knowing. A Finn was found 10 years ago living in a milk house on the farm. He ran away from the cavalry during the First World War because he was afraid of horses. 45 years Vonu. It can be done. I doubt if it can be done without a lot of help. Sweden is like a small town. Everywhere. A Swede I know came from Poland during Hitler's invasion. He was an injured 15-year-old Russian high-wire circus performer. He's got people who come checking up on what he's doing yet. I doubt if he's aware of it. He's got a friend. The blog to great lengths to watch everybody. A foreigner disappear? Not goddamned likely. I still say Guevara was found by aerial photography. Here's why. The LA Free Press had a note where someone at some Air Force Base in California, Vandenberg, was boasting that a spy plane left there to photorap them hills. True, a high altitude photo may not just do everything needed. However, they've got cameras that will focus for less than 60,000 feet and as there's no risk at all, they can come back many times. And you can pick up game trails without too much trouble. Radar will photograph the ground and eliminate all foliage. I've seen some of the photos, reprints and way, and it's really weird. From low altitude you should get enough detail to see any digging for arms caches easily. Now these blug were very interested in him. They trained special groups to deal with him. I can't see them begrudging the cost of film. It's true that all areas of the world can't be covered so intensely. But patterns show on those real high altitude photos. And for geologic, mineral reasons they may become interested in any area intensely enough for more and closer photos, giving small details. And there you are. So I favor digging. Limestone caves are damp and prone to flooding. Yet they are deep enough to be warm. Maybe you could start there and dig to eliminate dampness and flooding. It should be lots easier to dig up than down. And there's plenty of space for dirt. Some caves may have enough ventilation for cooking with a wood fire. Easter Island is full of small caves formed by gas bubbled in molten lava. Glass. There's two kinds of islands in the Pacific. Coral and volcanic. It seems to me that caves could be found in all the volcanic areas of the world and that's a lot. All the caves are apt to be small though and may even be dangerous due to gas in a new air option. A plug of concrete may solve that in most cases. Maybe there are dikes. Lava intrusions, insist you. Geological maps may show some. B. 
Sweden. And there you have it folks. Brian here, Rayo 2's robot co-host, to take us out. I hope you enjoyed this selection of articles from Vonu Life. The collection has thus far hit 252 pages, and there's still another handful to go. In the meantime, please do go snag Vonu Life, March 1973, both me and Rayo 2's favorite Vonu release. It is also the one most practical in terms of action. Hence, why we love it so much. Just go to libertyunderattack.com, you can find that book and the rest of our quite expansive catalog there. Including privacy tools, ghost pads and ghost phones. Thanks for tuning in. Until next time, always remember, Vonu is yours for the making and the second realm is yours for the building.